introduce us both in just a moment. But first off, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, after the last couple of years, it's very nice to have this chance to uh, present to people and actually see faces while we're presenting. Uh, and I also want to thank everyone who's attending virtually as well. And also thank the NC Live staff for this setup, which is going to allow more people to see this presentation today. Uh, when I saw that this year's NC Live uh, conference was themed around literacy for all, uh, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to share this project, which we definitely very much saw as a literacy project. As you're seeing throughout this conference, there are a lot of different types of literacy and digital media literacy is particularly becoming more and more important, especially for younger patrons. And digital media literacy isn't just being able to navigate those online uh, digital media products. It's also uh, giving our patrons the tools to create digital media, their own digital media products that they can share online as well. So our Digital Media Lab project was specifically designed to give members of our community that hands-on uh, opportunity to increase their digital media literacy in these kind of immersive hands-on environments. And today we're gonna show you step-by-step -step our process uh, for creating a Digital Media Lab. So my name is Justin Stout. I am the Head of Information Services for News Regional Libraries, and this is Sean Moore. He's our technology specialist. Um, I was the project lead for our Digital Media Lab project, and Sean was also heavily involved in the process of designing the lab, um, as well as coming up with the procedures for the Digital Media Lab sessions. I want to give you a little bit of backstory about today. Uh, we had a digital media specialist named Jerry, who was going to be with us uh, here today. Um, that's the part-time position that we've come up uh, to help patrons in the lab. We're going to definitely talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, he was going to present with us today, but unfortunately, a little over a month ago, he walked into my office and told us that he got a full-time job offer somewhere else. He, he got an offer he couldn't refuse, is how he put it. Um, he was really fantastic in that role, and we definitely miss him, but we're very fortunate to have a new digital media specialist, Grayson. Uh, Grayson actually started out as a patron using our digital media lab, and when the position became open, he applied for it, and he got the job. So we have our own success story with our digital media lab right inside our own library. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of context about our library system. Um, our headquarters is located in Kenston, North Carolina. We serve a population of about 87,000 across Lenore, Jones, and Greene counties. Uh, we're about 30 miles south of Greenville, uh, about 80 miles southeast of Raleigh, and 70 miles west of the Crystal Coast. Our eight libraries serve uh, different populations. Kenston, for example, is a small town environment, while Greene County and Jones County are a little bit more rural. And we also have a very diverse community. Uh, about half of the population is non-white. We also have some attractions you might've heard of before, like the Chef and the Farmer restaurant, which was featured on the PBS series of Chef's Life, the Down East Wood Ducks, who are a minor league baseball team, as well as Mother Earth Brewing. And I just wanna do a little bit of shameless self-promotion for our library and tell you that our libraries were named a 2022 IMLS National Medal finalist. Uh, we're really proud of that recognition IMLS has given um, for us for how we serve our community. So I'm going to start from the very beginning and talk about, uh, I'm going to describe the whole process of what we went through to create our digital media lab. And I'm going to start with why we decided to pursue this project in the first place. Uh, we were definitely looking for projects that could potentially serve needs in our community that weren't currently being met. And one thing we noticed is that many of our patrons, particularly the younger patrons, uh, we're looking for, resources for, looking for resources to create that digital content they could share online. And our community has many things to offer them, but available studio space is definitely not one of them. Uh, because we saw being able to use these digital media creation tools as essential to being able to assist patrons with creating these kind of digital media products, our leadership team agreed that this really would be a perfect opportunity to meet uh, a need in our community that wasn't currently being met. We also saw this project as being extremely relevant. Uh, digital media is definitely becoming an increasingly important part of our everyday lives. And we also realized that in order to really give our patrons those opportunities to learn new media creation skills, we needed to give them a place where they could gain that hands-on experience with using the different types of equipment. So those are the primary benefits of a digital media lab. Uh, there are a few side effects that also benefit the library as well. Uh, the Digital Media Lab is a great way to get patrons who would have never previously used the library excited about going to the library. It also really does create some significant positive publicity for your library and the community. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later on. And the bottom line is that Digital Media Labs are just plain fun 
Uh, we get a lot of terrific feedback from our patrons about what a good time they had using the Digital Media Lab. And that helps create an enduring positive image of the library for them, as well as anybody they relate their experience to in the future. So I do wanna acknowledge that we're far from the first library to offer a digital media lab uh, to patrons. Uh, two existing digital media labs particularly served as inspiration for us when we were creating ours. Uh, one was U Media at the Chicago Public Library, as well as the Hunt Library right here at North Carolina State University. Uh, obviously, we weren't able to work on quite the same uh, scale of uh, or budget as those programs, uh, but they really did inspire us to look at the Digital Media Lab as that gateway for our local aspiring musicians, directors, designers um, to, to pursue their dreams. Uh, we were particularly inspired by stories about famous rappers like Chance the Rapper and No Name getting their start at U Media in Chicago. And obviously that's gonna be on the high aspirational end of what a digital media lab can offer the community. Uh, but we also visited the Hunt Library here at NC State and we saw firsthand how the availability of those digital media creation spaces uh, really was opening new doorways for future creators. So before we get any further in the process, I do want to also mention that uh, we identified the Digital Media Lab as a project that would help us meet our goals and objectives in our strategic plan. I'm not gonna get too into the weeds on the goals and action steps uh, that the project helped us realize, but I do wanna point out that the three overall areas of focus that we divided our strategic plan into were inspiring creativity, fostering learning and engaging community. And when you think about it, Digital Media Labs really do address all three of those areas. Um, they're giving patrons those new pathways to explore creative processes. They're giving them spaces where they can learn more about digital media creation. And they're bringing new patrons into the library and reinforcing it as a positive place in the community. Uh, so now we can start getting into the fun stuff. Uh, you decide you wanna put a digital media lab in your library. Uh, what are the next steps? So I hope that our presentation is gonna give you a good overview of our process and point out some considerations based on our experiences that you might wanna make before you get too far into the process. Uh, I think before you take any further steps, you need to answer these three essential questions. Uh, the first is where are you gonna put the lab in your library? And that may seem like an obvious question, but sometimes it's a little hard to answer. And there are a lot of small logistical considerations you need to, um, to consider before you decide where you're gonna put it in your library. And Sean's gonna talk about some of those a little bit later. Uh, the next question is probably gonna be very much on your mind uh, because you can't get too far into the project without answering it. And that's how you're gonna fund your project. Um, you definitely need to consider from the beginning, not just uh, the installation of the media lab, but also any continuing cost as well as, uh, are you gonna provide any staffing for the project as well? And then finally, you need to think about how you're gonna actually install the lab. Um, do you feel like your in-house staff can completely handle that entire process or do you wanna outsource the project to a contractor? So the first of those questions is where are you gonna put your digital media lab? Uh, we ourselves had a little bit of a difficult time answering that question at first. We knew that we definitely wanted to offer a digital media lab to our patrons, uh, but we weren't completely sure where we could put it in the library. Some of the locations we considered weren't really suitable uh, because uh, they weren't really suitable for that closed studio environment that's really necessary for this kind of digital media lab, or they were adjacent to those heavily trafficked areas of the library. Uh, what we finally settled on was formerly a supply closet off of our auditorium. You can um, see on the left what it looked like before the transformation. And we have a little video on the right that will show you what it looks like after we finish. So this location ended up being really great for providing that kind of isolated area that you need for a studio in the library. Um, there definitely are a few drawbacks, um, like decreased visibility, as well as having to schedule around programs in the auditorium from time to time. Uh, but we're gonna discuss how we dealt with those, pro those problems a little bit later. Obviously, one of the biggest questions you're gonna to need to answer when you start your planning process for the project is how you're gonna fund it. Um, so we saw the Digital Media Lab as a perfect opportunity for a Library Services and Technology Act grant. 
uh, which are available to public and academic libraries throughout the state of North Carolina. If any of you are unfamiliar with LSTA grants, they're federal funds that are provided by the Institute of Library and Museum Services uh, and administered by the state library, specifically set aside for these innovative patron focused projects. So we created our digital media lab through an easy LSTA grant uh, because of the window of time available to us. We wanted to move forward with the project and it was already past the deadline for a letter of intent for the bigger project grants. We do recommend if you consider an LSTA grant for your digital media lab, you really think about doing a project grant because the budget can easily exceed the limit for those easy grants. And this would actually be the perfect time to start thinking about uh, that because the uh, letter of intent process is typically due in November. There are other opportunities for funding digital media labs as well. Uh, I think these projects definitely have a certain air of excitement about them that can draw in potential sponsorships, whether it's businesses or individuals. I know I've read about other digital media labs uh, where local celebrities who are involved in uh, media production or music uh, were drawn to the project and were interested in sponsoring the project. I also just want to mention that ARPA has definitely created some unique opportunities for funding these projects. Uh, it definitely varies a lot from location to location, so you're probably going to have to do a little bit of research about how those funds are being used uh, locally, but it's definitely worth investigating. Um, that has helped us kind of add some of the features to our lab after we exceeded our initial LSDA budget. Um, so it's just another, another thing you can explore to fund your project. Obviously, this isn't a grant writing presentation, but I did briefly want to just share a few tips if you're writing a grant application for a digital media lab. Uh, the application, like any library grant, needs to be user focused. Um, it should center on how many library patrons are going to benefit from the project. So instead of saying something like the library is going to install a digital media lab, you would want to say something like library patrons will be able to access a digital media lab where they will be able to dot, 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 and then list the benefits that patrons will get from the project. Another way to strengthen your application is to include some of those success stories, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, if you look around on the internet, it's not hard to find uh, stories about other libraries and how their digital media labs have made a significant positive impact on their community. Uh, it starts with those stories about the famous rappers getting their start, but there are a lot of other stories about people who have made things that they started learning about in the digital media lab. Uh, things like uh, 3D modeling, graphic design, video production, how they eventually turned that into their career. And then finally, I encourage you to really embrace that concept we're sharing with you today that digital media literacy is an increasingly important form of literacy and digital media labs are definitely necessary tools in libraries for ensuring that patrons are be able to are able to become literate in it. So now I want to bring up another essential question that a lot of people don't really consider until later in the project and that's the level of staff assistance that you're going to provide in the digital media lab once it's done. Uh, so from based on our research, we saw that a lot of libraries that are offering digital media labs um, don't really offer um, hands-on assistance in the lab. They just allow people to use it independently. And that may work for your digital media lab if the idea is just to provide access for experienced digital media creators. Uh, but we really wanted our digital media lab to be accessible to the entire community. And that meant creating this digital media specialist uh, position that would assist part-time in the lab. And that would help encourage patrons who really want to use the lab, but are intimidated by the equipment. And it would also really strengthen those educational and in instructional elements of the project as well. Uh, another secondary but not insignificant benefit of having that digital media specialist there for sessions is ensuring that your equipment's used properly, which in, in turn ensures longevity and security of the equipment. Uh, we really see that as an element of ensuring continued access for the community because more people will be able to use it moving forward. Um, obviously, hiring a staff member specifically for this role is going to make the, um, the project a lot more costly. Um, but I think you really do have to do that cost-benefit analysis. Um, one more consideration, I think, is that it's a very specialized role, so it may be difficult to find a good fit for the position, uh, particularly in the current job market. We've been pretty fortunate in finding people that were good for the role, but we do acknowledge that it could be difficult um, and take some time to find a really good fit. And we'll talk about what makes a good fit in just a little bit. 
One more question I think you want to consider before you get too far into planning your project is who's going to install the technical equipment for the digital media lab. Um, if you have staff that have significant expertise in that area, you may already be set, but I would just caution you about underestimating how much expertise is necessary to put in a really top quality studio configuration. Uh, I would say that both of us consider ourselves to be fairly proficient with technology installations, but the contractor we ended up using uh, installed a configuration that required a level of expertise that was definitely beyond either of us. Um, and it would have required a lot of significant training on our parts to do that same kind of configuration. Uh, so I think that's another place where you just need to do a cost benefit analysis. And you may think the contracting a company to install the studio um, is more expensive, but just consider how much time is going to be required to staff if you don't. So here is a timeline uh, based on our experiences with the Digital Media Lab project. Uh, you can use this kind of timeline to map out your project while you're securing a funding source. Uh, once you have your funding committed, you can go ahead and start, hire, start hiring your digital media specialist at that point. Uh, we definitely recommend that that happen early in the process so that the digital media specialist can be involved in the implementation of the lab, uh, start developing programs for the lab, and gain any additional digital media training that they need before they can start helping patrons. And then at that point, you can start working with a contractor or library staff to start actually putting the library in place. Um, I have marketing at the end of the timeline, but realistically, you're going to be marketing throughout uh, the timeline, uh, starting with when you get your funding source, you want to do an announcement to the community, and then giving updates on social media with pictures of the installation as it's going. Um, that really builds interest uh, that really pays off when the lab eventually opens. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sean for a, a little bit, and he's going to talk about our installation process and the equipment in our lab. All right, good morning. Okay, so before we can get the ball rolling on setting up this space, um, we had a little bit of prep work that we had to do. Um, the main thing was to find a new home for everything that we had stored in the room, which was mostly tables and chairs. Um, luckily, we were able to rearrange a few things in our other rooms to give those a new home. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the next thing we had to worry about was painting. Now, over the years, um, you know, the room, it suffered a little battle damage, you know, storing chairs and tables in the room, a lot of marks and stuff on the walls. So uh, what we did, we just um, picked up a uh, couple of cans of paint from Lowe's and um, painted the walls ourselves and um, really got to give rec recognition to a couple of our staff, um, Shannon and Sandy, because they, they were all over it. Um, we put a couple of fresh coats of paint on the walls and um, before we knew it, it was done, it only took a couple of days. Um, it hides a lot of that damage and um, the neutral gray color that we chose, it helps absorb some of that excess light. So uh, we were able to, um, to control that when people are in the room shooting with studio lamps. Um, finally, we installed carpet squares in order to help the floor look a lot more presentable because you know the marks and everything from when we stored um, our tables and chairs. And um, it also dampened the sound to um, you know, cut off on that, um, on the noise that we were going to have coming from the room coming up. Um, so when converting an existing space into a media lab, there are a few concerns that came up that we had to address. Um, one was to make sure that the room was ADA compliant. And for anyone that doesn't know, ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which means that physical spaces, technology, or um, websites um, will have to be accessible to people with disabilities. So we had to make sure that the designer allowed enough space for everyone to, man to maneuver around the room uh, without any troubles. <clears throat> now, one thing that I noticed um, throughout the years when using this space was that whatever the temperature was outside, it will be about five times that in that room. So you can probably imagine once we get the electronic equipment inside and a few people, three or four people in the room, close the door and you know start making music. It's like we had to come up with some a solution for ventilation. So. Uh, we had a, a couple of options. One was to connect the existing HVAC um, that was currently in the building, pipe it into that room and put a vent into the ceiling. It's the first option. Second, just um, install a standalone system, which we ended up going with the latter since it was more um, cost-effective and it gave us the ability to control the temperature in the room immediately. 
Um, and of course, soundproofing is also a must when you consider a space like this. Um, right now we have panels on all the walls to dampen the sound a good bit. Um, I've used the room personally and I, I might've had the volume turned to maybe like 30% and the staff outside the room had no idea I was in there. So when I leave, the lights will be off and you know, I had to stumble through the dark to get out. Um, so anything louder than that 30%, it'll definitely start to leak outside of that room. Um, we're currently looking into options to soundproofing the doors that will hopefully cut off a little bit more of that sound. Um, so this was the fun part for me, um, helping to pick out the equipment. Um, in the early stages of planning out what the room was going to be, we had a talk with the uh, contractors, PC Sound. Um, the, and they let us know everything that we needed in order to make a successful space. Um, like, you know, some of the things we have listed here. Now, if you were to decide to do this, depending on what your needs are, this list might look completely different. Um, but for us, you know, we wanted to um, uh, graphic work, um, audio and music, um, production, uh, podcast, um, you know, things like that. So these are a few things that we, um, that we ended up picking up. A couple of workstations, um, Blackmagic 4K cameras, uh, got two of those, green screens, uh, microphones. Um, you know, the pretty much the um, standard uh, when you're coming up with a room like this. Um, before I hand it back over to Justin, one piece of equipment that I wanted to talk about, it's probably my favorite and it's too cool not to share, is the, um, the drum machine. The MPC Live 2 has hundreds of instrument samples across different genres of music that you can program to the 16 pads that are on the, on the device. Um, and you can piece together your own music uh, by just recording each of the samples as you play, or if, if you're good enough, you can play live. Um, I wanted to show a quick demonstration of someone doing just that. Um, here is a quick video of professional drummer David Fingers Hayes. Now, the idea behind getting a drum machine um, was to have an outlet for aspiring drummers and, uh, and beat makers. Um, now, I know we've all been in the classroom at some point where, you know, have students knocking on their desk with, and, with their fist and using pencils to make beats and everything. Um, those were the uh, people that we were looking to grab the attention of, as well as to provide an option for seasoned drummers like we just saw. Justin? All right, thanks, Sean. All right, so I wanted to discuss a little bit about what you should look for if you do decide to hire a digital media specialist for uh, your lab. I want to start off by saying experience isn't um, necessarily everything for this role. Uh, the more important thing to look for is that aptitude for picking up those skills with digital media creation equipment. Um, our digital media specialists, the two that we've had so far, haven't necessarily had extensive professional resumes. Uh, but they were obviously quick studies on these digital media technologies, and we could tell from interacting with them that they could pick things up fairly quickly. Um, nearby colleges with music, video production, and graphic design schools are great places to advertise these kinds of positions. Uh, I do want to stress that you shouldn't underemphasize the importance of customer service skills as well. Uh, the position is really all about providing that one-on-one -on -one experience in the digital media lab. So it really is important to have someone in that role who's good at working with people. Flexibility in scheduling is also a really good asset to have. Um, it's a part-time position, and we do generally try to schedule our sessions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we do generally try to schedule them at the same time each week. 
Uh, but sometimes we do have to schedule around something in the auditorium. So having someone who is flexible in their weekly hours is definitely an asset for the position as well. That also helps us with uh, outreach programs, which we're moving towards now and we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, again, I just want to stress that the most valuable asset that someone can bring to this position is enthusiasm. Um, both of our digital media specialists that we've had so far really have had that obvious love for creating digital media products. And it really shows in how quickly they are able to pick up these skills and also um, how they're able to share them with our patrons. Uh, so now the least exciting part, uh, you definitely do need to put a policy in place for your digital media lab as well. Um, how detailed you want to be with it is entirely up to you. I feel like sometimes different libraries prioritize different goals when they're creating their policies. Um, our priorities are mostly centered on access. We want as many members of our community as possible to access our digital media lab. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about our specific rules. They're available on our website if you want to take a look. Um, they're mostly about ensuring fairness of access for all patrons, as well as protecting the equipment for use by as many patrons as possible. Uh, setting a framework for patrons if they are interested in sharing their media, which helps us in turn promote the lab and create that culture of digital creation in our community. Um, and also just making all expectations clear to the patron before their lab sessions start. Uh, we definitely don't want to put excessive restrictions in place. Uh, we view the policies for our lab as having to make that same delicate balancing act that most library policies do between ensuring that fair experience for all patrons without limiting access for individuals. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sean to talk a little bit about scheduling, sessions, and marketing. Okay, so um, so when it comes to scheduling out the media lab, uh, patrons will have a two hour session uh, with help from our digital media specialists, um, which will be a, a first come first serve basis. Uh, we limited everyone to a one week session, oh, one week session, I'm sorry, to a one session per week to give everyone a fair shot at booking the space uh, due to high demand. Uh, patrons can book time either by visiting us at our service desk or they can book it themselves using the library's My Libro app. Uh, we remind patrons about their scheduled time, usually a day before the session. Um, if we have continuous no-shows from uh, that person, we may have to lower um, the priority in order to, to, to ensure fair access. <clears throat> So now once your session um, has began, like I mentioned before, patrons are given a, um, a two hour block to work on whatever it is they choose. Um, at the time of booking, we ask the patron what they'd like to work on so we can prepare the room for them when they arrive. Uh, we have a lot of equipment in our lab and it can look very intimidating, but, um, but you don't have to worry because we will have our specialists in the room with them. So uh, whatever they may need, you know, they can just let the specialists know and they will take care of everything. Um, and of course, patrons will retain the rights to whatever it is they, they create. Um, you know, we do encourage people to share um, what they create for marketing purposes, uh, but ultimately the creation will belong to the patron. So we'd like to talk a little bit about our uh, marketing process. Um, in a way to market, um, the market, the media lab markets itself, uh, word of mouth spreads quickly through um, the community about a free studio space. Um, but the lab also provides tools to create professional marketing materials like videos, flyers, um, images for social media, um, and signage, which we, um, we want to share a few of our marketing products, um, our lab specialist and marketing librarian put together. Uh, the first one here is a teaser, a teaser that features Nate, uh, one of our regulars who we'll discuss a little bit later on. If you make you stay. What an act so angry all the time I would've keep it all inside I let you know how much I love you every day So social media is an important part of marketing in the digital media lab. Uh, this is where patrons usually want to, uh, want their content to go. Um, so it's a great way to meet the patrons where they are and make them aware of our services, which ties back to the word of mouth that I just mentioned. Um, 
we were mentioned in a post recently that went viral on a local level um, cause, and caused us um, to have our lab booked for over the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Uh, here's an example of the video content we posted on social media. So if you have a setup like ours where the digital media lab is located away from the library's main public service areas, um, it can be a bit hard to do in-library marketing. Our solution was to use one of the, um, our in-library displays to show another video designed to loop to show patrons what the digital media lab looks like. We printed a large sign to go next to the video to help draw attention to the display. So because of the lab's appeal to patrons who may not be library regulars, we also wanted to try some new types of marketing. Uh, we've done bulk mailers before, but we never use the every door direct mail service. This lets you pick multiple routes and provide mailers to the post office, um, which they'll drop those mailers off um, on every stop on those routes. Um, now we did have some difficulties with our local post office at first, uh, but we did eventually get the mailers out and um, we, they got you know, to where they were supposed to go. And we received um, <laughs> some positive uh, responses from people that received the mailers. They actually brought them into the library when they came to, uh, to sign up the digital media lab, which is which pretty nice. So here's one last example of uh, marketing materials, a video that we put together um, and put out on social media for the Christmas season. Don't cry, you snowman, not in front of me. Who will get your tears if you can't? All right, so another type of marketing is uh, to use the creations of people that use the Digital Media Lab. Uh, as patrons complete musical projects with their permission, we'll upload their tracks to the library's SoundCloud account. Um, here's an example of Nate Jones' cover of Fast Car. which brings us to our first success story. Uh, now, Nate first started coming in doing covers of songs like the one you just heard. Um, he's, he was completely hands off on the technical side. Um, he would just bring in his guitar and you know, his voice and he just did his thing. Um, but after working with our then lab assistant, Jerry, um, he was able to come in and start setting up the equipment himself, um, setting up the software and equipment however he needed. And um, Jerry, he was pretty much just hands off. He would just sit back and let him do his thing. Um, Nate now makes music mostly at his home, but he still drops by every now and again just to, you know, get some advice. <clears throat> Next, we have Tony, who's a regular at our library and has experience working in music for about 20 years or so. Um, and he, he makes a point to let us all know that, you know, what we're doing with the lab is, is pretty awesome. Uh, he also mentions how he's used studios in other locations and uh, you know, he'd be charged anywhere from like $200 an hour or more. Um, and it's never gotten the amount of help that we were able to provide. 
Um, he currently comes in to create social media content and produce music, music to um, help with his career. Justin. All right, I'm just gonna talk about a few more things and then we'll take your questions. Um, I wanna share a couple more aspects of the program. Uh, when we were de designing the Digital Media Lab, we definitely wanted to offer programs to the public, uh, but there are limitations that keep us from really doing traditional library programs. For one, the size of the space that's available really only allows three or four people at most um, to be in there at, at a time. Um, and there are also limitations on the digital media specialist schedule as well. So we decided to take the approach of offering programs as an option for those one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, following a pre-designed program rather than patrons bringing their own project to the lab. And what we realized what the, was that this would actually further increase access to the lab uh, because some, some patrons might want to explore what's in the lab, uh, but feel intimidated by not having their own project to bring and not really sure where to start. Uh, so by offering these programs as an option for their session, we're uh, allowing them to kind of receive a guided tour of the digital media lab and see some of the things that the lab can do in person. Um, we're currently working on more programs, but ones that we've offered so far uh, include making a beat with the library's drum machine, which you saw earlier, uh, making animated GIFs with Photoshop or making green screen videos with the camera and lighting available in the digital media lab space. Another key part of the process we haven't discussed yet is surveys. Uh, we asked patrons to complete a survey after at least their first digital media lab session to get insights into their experience. Obviously, we need to do this survey for um, our reporting for our grants, uh, but it also helps us in real time identify equipment or services that we could be offering but aren't currently offering to our patrons that will really enhance their experience in the future. Um, this is also our opportunity to ask patrons if they're willing to share their finished um, digital media products um, to, again, just market the digital media lab and create that, that atmosphere of digital creation in the community. Um, in the coming months, uh, thanks to one of our other new projects at our library, we're going to be able to take some of this digital media lab equipment out on the road. Uh, our digital resource rover, which is our new 21st century bookmobile, um, offering not just books, but also those digital services and programming. Um, we're going to have the digital media specialists go out at least once a month with them to offer this kind of programming um, at remote locations throughout our region. Uh, we purchased a mobile isolation booth like you see on the left there to allow people to kind of get a little bit of that studio recording experience on the road. Um, and we'll also be able to take things like our cameras, video equipment, and drum machine to let people use them um, in outreach programming as well. Uh, we hope that by offering outreach programming specifically related to the Digital Media Lab, we're going to be able to increase interest even further um, and bring in more of those patrons that might not have otherwise heard of the lab. Uh, so to sum up, uh, the Digital Media Lab definitely is a powerful tool for increasing digital media literacy in our community, uh, but it's not just that. It's also helping us make real connections with uh, our community and members of the community. For example, recently a local educator was looking for a place to re record a remote podcast interview that would really raise the community's profile. And the Digital Media Lab was really the only place in town that could offer that, her that professional space to do a podcast interview. Uh, we're currently also talking to another local individual who's working on a local streaming platform about uh, giving people who make products in our Digital Media Lab opportunities um, for a bigger platform for their creations. Uh, the bottom line is that people get excited about these kind of projects, and that can really open new doorways to potential new collaborations and increased exposure for the library and the community. So I want to thank you again for attending our presentation. Um, our contact information is up here on the screen, as well as our website. Uh, you can find a page on our website specifically dedicated to the Digital Media Lab under the services section. Uh, it's got our SoundCloud embedded up there as well, as well as more information about the lab. Uh, you can also see our policies for the lab um, under our policy section. It's part of the information services policy. Um, so yeah, we'll be happy to take any questions you have now. Sure. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, it's a, a premiere, I think. Adobe premiere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got that software. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how big the routes are. I think they generally, it depends on a lot of factors, I think. I think we hit three routes, so it was every stop on the route for about $250, $300. So it's fairly cost efficient for how many houses are reached. Now, how many people actually pay attention to that mailer? That's always the question. But it was just something new that we want to try. And we did have good results with it because we did have people bring those mailers into the library um, and ask about it. So. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, is it currently? A, I don't think it is available. I think we just give it to patrons when they do the land. Um, yeah, if you shoot us an email, we'll definitely, yeah, make sure you get a link to that. Okay. Yes. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so the, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the question, the first question was what software we use to create those marketing videos. And the answer was Adobe Premiere for that. Uh, the second question was about um, the cost for the every door direct mail, right? Yes. Which I think for three routes, uh, which was, I think, about, about 2,000 houses or 2,000 residences, that was about $250, $300. Um, and then was there, what was the last question? Oh, the surveys. Yeah, if anyone wants to see the survey, right now we just give it to people when they complete their digital media lab session. But if anyone wants to see it, we'd be happy to share it. Just shoot us an email and we'll be happy to give you the link. Sure. Uh, individual users, probably about, um, what'd you say, 10 to 15, because there are repeat sessions. So it's not a huge number right now, but we are kind of limited by the digital media specialist schedule. Um, he's only able to offer a few sessions per week now. We're hoping to expand that later this year um, to start being able to offer more sessions. And one thing that we'd like to offer moving forward is the opportunity for people who've used it a little bit to demonstrate to us that they're able to use it independently. And then we'll start scheduling sessions with them independently. Uh, we do need to work out kind of, uh, I mean, certification is probably too formal of a word, but some kind of process for them to demonstrate to us um, that they're able to use the lab independently. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh we've been our two that we've had so far really have been pretty independent and like just looking for i mean there's just a ton of stuff on youtube that they can watch specifically for these so we haven't really had to explore too many um like professional like paid resources for them i mean really they've been able to look on youtube and get a lot of training that way and we regularly interact with them and like see how their progress is so that we can monitor and make sure that they're um we've done a couple mock sessions with them where we'll pretend to be a patron and come in and uh, ask them to do different things and then give them feedback and say hi hey, you might want to look more into this and explore more how to use this particular tool but yeah, really, we haven't had to, to do too many paid resources there. There's just so much freely available on YouTube. And the, um, yeah, you probably should. Yeah. 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 And the company that, that helps set up everything, PC Sound, they did leave a very thorough uh, manual for everything that has set up um, the settings for, um, for our rack for streaming and the lights and everything. It's, it's very drawn out. So. If anyone didn't know how to set any of that up, they can refer back to that manual that they set up for us. Yeah, that's one benefit of using a studio contractor, I think that we didn't really mention is that they definitely do provide training. So that's another on top, if you don't use one on top of your staff having to train themselves, they're gonna have to train the digital media specialists as well. Whereas paying those, um, that contractor had allowed us to use, just use them for training. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so we do, uh, we definitely have had teens use it. I'm not sure if they've really used it for school projects as much as their own projects. Uh, our process for people under 18 is that we do uh, ask that they get parental permission. We have a form for them to fill out. That will, so when people schedule, we will ask them if they're under 18 to just get, uh, to get one of those forms and take it to their parent and get parental permission to use um, the digital media lab. But yes, we definitely have had some, um, multiple teenagers use the lab. Um, you definitely have to remind them about their session because they're prone to forget about it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about the school projects, but they, they definitely have been using it for sure. Yes. We do warn people up front, patrons, we do ask that they bring their own media if they want to uh, transfer it because we do, yeah, we will clear files after their session. Uh, so we do make it clear like in that policy in that form that they sign up front that they do need to bring something. And we do have some available, some large um, flash drives. I mean, we warn them that's not the best way to store things for sure, but, but we do, yeah, we do work with them up front to make sure that their media gets transferred to them. Yep, yep. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah oh absolutely yeah we've been we've started thinking about that for sure our the digital resource rover definitely is equipped to power things so but but there definitely are a lot of logistical considerations there for sure did you, uh, -huh. uh, that's a good question. So we, I mean, we, we leave that to the patron pretty much. Um, we do try to be respectful of copyright and you've, I mean, we've heard, it can be tricky with covers, I know, because that can be a little difficult and we would uh, uh, comply with any takedown requests for sure. Um, but basically, if the and because we're offering a free service, we feel like we're okay unless someone specifically wants us to take the product down. Uh, but we do leave that to our patrons. If they're going to do anything with their digital media products, then they need to navigate those those intellectual property. Uh, it's definitely a tricky area for sure, uh, and something that we're always thinking about. But we would definitely comply with any requests to take anything down that anyone felt was violating any copyright. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think we have had a lot of interest in this from younger uh, teenage male patrons that weren't really interested in library services before, for sure. Uh, I think for a while we were getting a call every day. It's like, I heard y'all have a studio. <laughs> and so that has definitely been a fun, um, a fun Part of the project for sure. I think definitely we did want to try to in, attract people because we have definitely noticed that the library is not used. It's used by children. It's used by older people, or at least ours is, but we do have a hard time with those older teens and those younger adults. And I think this has definitely raised the library's profile in the community with, with the, definitely with those segments of the population for sure. It's been open since November. Yep. Any more questions? All right. Thank you all again. Yep. Mm-hmm.
Oh, wow, that was perfect timing.